did not purposefully give Michelle Schumacher the most difficult time slot on the schedule right after lunch. Well, maybe we did because we think she's going to do a great job of keeping us awake. She won't even have to try. So Michelle Schumacher uh, is originally from Minnesota in the United States. She studied at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. She studied theology at the University of Freiburg, where her, she also wrote her license, her STL thesis on redemption under the direction of Jean-Pierre Terrell. She did her doctorate in theology at the John Paul II Institute for the Study of the Family in Washington, D.C., writing on Hansor's von Balthasar. She's done important original research on the, the, uh, the close collaborator of Balthasar, Adrian von Speyer. She has written and edited books and written articles on what has been called the new feminism. She actively writes in the area of family issues, but also gender theory, both in English and in French. If you're interested in that, you might want to, if you read French, look at her contributions on that, especially, I believe, in Nova Vetera, the Swiss Francophone edition. The original Nova Vetera. <laughs> <laughs> of which the, the main editor is happens to be present in this room. <laughs> so with Michelle, uh, this is not her, the first time that she'll be speaking on the Trinity in Balthazar and St. Thomas. What I've learned from Michelle Schumacher is that there are various important natural elements and factors that are really crucial in order to do theology well. For example, to be teaching motivated and gifted students to have access to a good academic library. Other factors include friendship, good food, and good wine. So Michelle has written a book, a rather extensive book, published with Catholic University Press, a Trinitarian Anthropology, Advent von Speyer and Hans Urs von Balthasar in Dialogue with Thomas Aquinas. It's the fruit of her habilitation She's become more European in her second doctorate, which she did in a citadel of Thomism called Freiburg. And she, she succeeded in that. And this book is very much the fruit of many long conversations and debates, I won't say arguments, between uh, Michelle, um, Father Emery, myself, and several other people. And so she's in a way just continuing this project. Michelle is privat sense, so she is Professor of Moral Theology at the University of Freiburg, and she will speak on Balthazar and St. Thomas on the Trinity. I am not up to the challenge to keep you awake, but I want you to know I'm a mother of four, and I'm accustomed to speaking with no one listening. So. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> For those of us who studied during the long pontificate of John Paul II, at least for those of us who read him regularly, I don't know about Dominicans, one passage from the Second Vatican Council remains almost ingrained in our minds, acting as a common point of reference not only for Christian anthropology and ethics, but also for theology, properly speaking. That passage, I almost want to say, of course, is Gaudium et Spes number 24. Now, I, I have to read it, so that means I isn't as ingrained as it used to be. Indeed, the Lord Jesus, when he prayed to the Father that all may be one as we are one, opened up vistas close to him in reason, for he implied a certain likeness between the union of the divine persons and the unity of God's sons in truth and charity. This likeness reveals that man is the only creature on earth whom God willed for his self, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. 
And because the model for this interpretation of the person as achieved through a sincere gift of self is, as John Paul II commented on this passage, and he most likely is the author of the passage upon which he's commenting, God himself as Trinity, as a communion of persons, it was simply taken for granted for many of us that the one who reveals himself as love is a mystery of personal self-giving communion, which is to say that the three persons love each other in the intimate mystery of the one divine life. We unquestionably took John Paul II at his words. Does this sound like a public confession? When he wrote, only in this way, that is to say, in the presentation of the three divine persons as loving each other in the intimate mystery of the one divine life, can we understand the truth that God himself is love? We were moreover exonerated when the Catechism too presented God's very being as love by sending his only son in spirit of love and the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. God himself is an external exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he has destined us to share in this exchange. From this particular image of the Trinity and our destined participation therein, it's a short step to the affirmation of Hans von Balthasar as he borrowed it from Gregory the Great, that love can only be agape, caritas, if it reaches out toward the other. Where God is defined as loved, he must be in essence perfect self-giving, which can only elicit from the beloved in return an equally perfect movement of thanksgiving, service, and self-giving. More foreign to us, ironically enough, given the importance that it is assumed throughout much of the Christian tradition, was the Augustinian analogy of the Trinity drawn from human psychology, mens notitia and amour, and inspiring the analogy of Aquinas. The intelligible word proceeds from the speaker, yet remains in him, and love proceeds from the will without its object ever wandering far from the lover's heart. I had to put a little Balthazarian twist on that. That's not St. Thomas. Having been captivated by John Paul II's phenomenological and that realism, which pointed a way, a way beyond the gnosticological attitude that had reigned for centuries in philosophy and more recently in theology, we were unlikely to subscribe to an analogy that even apparently drew upon a self-referential view of knowledge and will. Despite all regard for the greater dissimilitude than simil similitude implied in any analogical discourse about God, it was to be more specific the necessary imminent character of the Augustinian Thomistic analogy that failed to address a generation vaccinated against Enlightenment epistemologies. Still captivated by the lingering influence of nominalism, however, and perhaps all too easily misunderstanding Jean Paul II's personalism, we were struck by the disparity between Aquinas's analogy of God in the admittedly limited manner in which it was understood and the call launched by the Council and so persistently by Jean Paul II to pattern our relationships and mode of self-fulfillment after the self-giving love of the divine persons. It was at any rate obvious to us that the plenitude of divine being requires, as Balthazar reasoned, the reciproc reci reciprocal ecstasy of the divine persons in order to unfold itself as absolute love, and in doing so is absolute truth. Love, we heartedly agreed, supposed the one, the other, and their unity. Now, of course, when St. Thomas presents the processions of the word from the Father in his own version of the Augustinian analogy, he has in mind to complete the analogy as it bears upon the procession of the Holy Spirit, that this is not any sort of word, but a word which breathes forth love. To see it otherwise would be to call into question the efficacy of the analogy itself, for the processions are distinguished by their order. 
The Son proceeds from the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Hence, although St. Thomas admits that will and intellect are not diverse in God, he nonetheless insists upon the analogy whereby nothing can be loved by the will unless it is conceived by the intellect, as pointing to the Trinitarian order. From the very fact of saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds by way of will and the Son by way of intellect, it follows that the Holy Spirit is from the Son. For love proceeds from a word. We are able to love nothing but that which a word of the heart conceives, he says. Not only does this analogy of a word-breathing love illuminate the mystery of the divine processions, it also serves to describe the intellectual illumination of the believer caused by the revealed word of God, which breaks forth into an affection of love, as it is said, in John's Gospel, everyone that hath heard from the Father and hath learned cometh to me. Hence, to per perceive the Word of God as such, to recognize its divine origin, implies a certain experiential knowledge, which is properly called wisdom, St. Thomas says. The Word made flesh thus imitates the faithful into two sorts of knowledge. So in John's, in the commentary of St. John, chapter 17, St. Thomas writes, First, it is that of doctrine, and he's referring to this by saying, I have made known to them your name, teaching them by my external words. No man has ever seen God. The only begotten Son who is from the bosom of the Father has made him known. The other knowledge is from within through the Holy Spirit. The fruit of this knowledge is that the love wherewith you loved me may be in them and I in them. In short, as Dominic Legg, an, another doctoral student of Jill Emery, explains, sanctifying knowledge of the truth accounts for the indwelling of the Son and consequently for the gift and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For where there is the word of God, there is necessarily the Spirit of God, whose name is love, or gift. St. Thomas thus recognizes that his psychological analogy of the Trinity is best understood by one who has been initiated into the Holy Mystery, by one whom God is presented as the object known is in the knower and the beloved in the lover. It is, in other words, by participating in the processions of himself, by knowing as God knows, namely by the impression of his word within the intellect, and by loving as God loves, in virtue of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that one can finally be said to know the love of God. I, your word, will be in them. And by that fact that I am in them, Thomas comments, the love wherewith your love may be in them, that is, will be given to them, and you will love them as you have loved me. Or as Father Emery explains, the love through which both Father and Son are together one is also the love through which they met us into their communion. The genius of St. Thomas is such that he employs the same analogy, the interplay of intellect and will, to illustrate the mystery of the Holy Trinity and the Christian's initiation therein, his or her grace participation in the Trinitarian processions, which presupposes man's spiritual nature. For, as the uncreated Trinity is distinguished by the procession of the word from the speaker and of love from both of these, so also, Thomas explains, does there exist an image of the uncreated trinity in the rational creature, wherein we find a procession of the word in the intellect and a procession of love in the will? Because, moreover, the word of God is born of God according to the knowledge of himself, and love proceeds from God according as he loves himself, the image of God is found in the soul according as the soul turns to God, or possesses a nature that enables him to turn to God. 
It follows that the human intellect and will are shown by St. Thomas to have been fashioned on the basis of the deifying intentions. Hence, as Father Terrell puts it so well, creation is not external to, but at the heart of the Trinitarian communion, that is to say, of the circulatio that passes from the Father through the Son and returns toward him through and in the Spirit, in drawing the universe into his love. Balthazar would love this. Now clearly, such a personal, even mystical vision of the Trinity appears far from the cold and calculating idea of God, more philosophical than theological, Balthazar explains, as a perfectly self-contained monism who understands and loves himself and all else on account of his own goodness. Such as André Mallet describes the common impression of St. Thomas's teaching in 1954 as a sort of urgottite, an original divinity from which gushes forth the triune God. Indeed, for the reader who picks up the Summa for the first time, assuming that this is his first introduction, God is encountered, obviously, as one whose love is evident in this. He has will. And for in sum whomever there is will, Thomas reasons, there must be love. And there must be will in God, since there is intellect in him. After all, will follows upon intellect. As for the seductive power of the Augustinian presentation of love as a binding force, it's taken by St. Thomas to mean, at least in the first instance, that the good that God wills for himself is no other than himself, who is good by his essence. Indeed, divine beatitude consists in God's perfect knowledge of himself. Now, such an apparently solipistic vision of God is not necessarily dispelled when one enters more properly into Thomas's treatise on the Trinity, for the imminent, imminent processions are brilliantly crafted in view of maintaining the divine unity. Whence I return to the idea of God who loves himself. When anyone understands and loves himself, he is in himself, not only by real identity, but also as the object understood is in the one who understands and the thing loved in the lover. To be sure, the mutual love between the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit is not entirely lacking, nor is the rich mystical and biblical doctrine of circumcession, which is arguably at the heart of the Trinitarian theology. Apparently, if not intentionally absent, is nonetheless the ecstatic character of love that is developed in his treatise on the virtues, for example. For it is not admissible to say that God is placed outside of himself. Now, to be sure, St. Thomas does invoke the force of love to move and impel the will of the lover towards the object loved in his account of the name chosen for the Holy Spirit. Because spirit designates impulse and notion in corporal things, it is fitting that the one who proceeds from love should be so named, he reasons. Obviously, no such tendency is to be thereby discerned in the incorporal and absolute immutable God, however. At any rate, we could hardly be further from Balthazar's own argument that if God is defined as love, he must be so not only in an intransitive sense, but he must also love the divine other transitively. Similarly, given the imminent structure of the word within St. Thomas's Trinitarian theology, word is not to be understood dialogically, as that is to say, analogical to the manner whereby the human spirit goes beyond subjectivity and reaches out to other persons in view of communion and mutual intercourse, as Balthazar proposes in his own analogy as influenced by Adrian von Speyer. Instead, by word is meant in St. Thomas's analogy of the Trinity that which is signified by and thus prior to the spoken word, an interior word, or a conception of the object understood. 
From Balthazar's perspective, however, any such word of the heart must assume a transitive mode if it is to be an authentic word of love. The verbum mentis that has its source and inmost being and the love that causes and accompanies it do not turn the person in on himself in a superficial interpretation of Augustine's Amagio Trinitatis might lead one to believe, but rather reveal the mystery of being through the mutuality in love. In short, we have to take seriously the scriptural affirmation that God is love, then this love must presuppose, Balthazar's, Balthazar argues, not numerical, but transcendental plural plurality. If that is to say, it is to go beyond mere self-love, delexio, and become caritas, the highest of the perfections created by God and which is found eminently in him. This is not to suggest that Balthazar would have us simply substitute the impersonal model of the the interpersonal model of the Trinity proposed by Richard of St. Victor, for example, since he rec recognizes that it cannot attain the substantial unity of God. On the other hand, he does call into question St. Thomas's decision to order the processions according to the principle that something cannot be loved unless it is known. This, Balthazar argues, ironically enough, given the quantity of similar criticisms that is launched at his own theology on precisely this point, is simply an importation from the created order into the divine world. Now I quote, there is an order here. Love presupposes knowledge, while knowledge presupposes being. But the love that stands at the end of the sequence as the goal of its unfolding stands, in another perspective at its beginning, as the basic impulse underlying it. Eternity is a cir circulation in which beginning and end join in unity. By the same token, Everything that has a ground, every truth claim that needs grounding, occurs within this order. But the order itself is sustained by the ultimate ground, which is love. To be sure, God is eternal truth, and by this truth, other thing, all things are true and meaningful. But the very existence of truth, of eternal truth, is grounded in love. Herein might be discerned Balthazar's primary concern, defending the specifically Christian revelation that God is love, as revealed by the indissoluble unity of the figure of Jesus. Eternal love is not only present in this man, but also in him, manifests and interprets its very nature and renders it visible not as a simple metaphor of eternal love, but eternal love itself. By this statement, Balthazar points to the figure of Christ as one in whom the super-essential mystery of the divine, triune love becomes evident, both on the basis of this figure's constitution, um, this figure, the gestalt in this German sense, He's always the loving son of the loving father who reveals the mutual exclusive knowledge between them, as well as because of the radiating grace that it in turn radiates outward. By no means does the incarnate son reveal the father only per modum intellectus. For what the son reveals is, Balthazar argues, primarily the father's love not accepting the Spirit's mission of bringing to light and searching the ever deeper abysses of the renunciatory love of Father and Son. This does not mean, Balthazar admits, that the absolutely incomprehensible reality that God is love has become graspable in the form of Christ, for it is without analogy. Nonetheless, for Balthazar, the incarnate word always remains the starting point 
and the abiding substantrum of the upward movement towards the word who is with God. And his actions only make sense if they are seen as expounded, as expressing the nature of divine love. So if we're going to do theology, it has to begin with the figure of Christ. It is thus on the basis of Jesus's Trinitarian relationship with God that Balthazar suggests we should construct a picture of divine essence and being. The incarnate son does not speak about God in general. He explains, but he shows us the Father and he gives us the Holy Spirit. Similarly, on the basis of Christ's own words about his relationship with the Father, it is clear to Balthazar that they interpenetrate in their reciprocal, loving self-surrender. In the Gospel of St. John, for example, the same concept of receptivity is used to describe both the Son's eternal mission and obedience and the mutual indwelling of the divine persons. The Swiss theologian thus invites us to recognize the incarnate word as one who affirms that the ground of his very being is received. It is his essence as son to receive life, insight, spirit, word, will, deed, doctrine, word, glorification from another. Of course, all of this is received in such a way that it has, he has it all in himself and disposes of it as his own. Nevertheless, the incarnate Son never fails to refer everything that he has and is back to the Father. Hence, there can be no question, Balthazar claims, of Jesus as man obeying himself as God, nor does he obey the Trinity as Son. In the Holy Spirit, he obeys the Father. Similarly, Balthazar observes that although he is God, he does not exposit himself in his humanity. Rather, he exposits the Father in the Holy Spirit, with whom he is identical as divine nature, but not as hypostasis. It is thus possible, Balthazar reasons, to recognize the Father's love in the form of the incarnate Son's obedience. Because Balthazar reasons more specifically, the Son's redemptive mission is rooted in his coming forth from the Father. He is the ecstasy of the divine Eros flowing out of himself, in which God hands himself over and entrusts himself to the world. Similarly, because his own surrender is grounded in the Father, which implies not only the power of self-expression, but also the power of self-surrender, he is the divine effluence expressing the entire life of the Trinity. Or still more straightforwardly, in receiving himself from the Father, the, Spirit, the Son also receives the natural will, by natural I mean the divine, to breathe forth the Spirit and thus to attune himself to that self-surrender that characterizes generation by the Father. And, you know, it might bear a comment before we go any further. When we hear the word surrender, 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 surrender in Balthazar, um, I think the word can, invokes a certain understanding among us as English speakers, but the, the German word is hingabe. And the, the, it's, it's a compound word, if you will. So the gaba is gift, and the hin is, is a prefix that is directional. So it's a gift that is directed toward. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Every time you hear surrender, we're, we're speaking hin gaba, and, and all that that evokes uh, in terms of image, uh, but also... Uh, it's a, it's a very rich term. To be sure, the incarnate word never speaks of his self-surrender in tones of ecstatic eros, but rather uses the almost deadpan words that point to his obedience. 
Without ever denying his own responsibility, he refers all the initiative and the ultimate responsibility, and thereby the glory and the consummate plan, back to the Father. In accord with his own teaching, he is to be understood as essentially handed over, that is to say, given up by the Father. An affirmation that Balthazar invites us to consider not so much as a substantial noun, as instead a transitive verb. The Christ form is no statically placed memorial, but is entirely to be understood as something that points beyond itself. The cross says, this is how much God has loved the world. And which God is that? God the Father, whose word to the world is Jesus' own word, in whose love the Father's love is to be interpreted. And it is God the Spirit, the Spirit of love, who is continually explaining this word of Im immeasurable love for us and in us. The word is scripture. No one has ever seen God. And the second half of that verse, the only begotten Son who dwells in the bosom of the Father has made him known, do not contradict each other. The second does not supersede or abolish the first, but confirms it by interpreting it. In short, it's on the basis of the uninterpreted filiation, uninterrupted, excuse me, uninterrupted filiation of the Son on earth as it is in heaven that we have access to the mystery of God's love, not only for us, but also, and still more fundamentally, Balthazar argues, in himself. Presupposed to the incarnation of the Word and his salvific mission is thus, Balthazar suggests, a Trinitarian substructure, in virtue of which the Son's self-surrender might be viewed as the economic representation of the Father's Trinitarian loving surrender. Hence, for example, the love that is in the Son, a mission received by way of generation, is the expression of a love that is in the Father, a mission to generate. In this way, the Son's generation from the Father is conceived by the Swiss theologian as a primordial act of love to which the Son responds, not passively, as the Beloved, but since he receives the Father's substance as his love, actively, as a lover returning love as one who responds to the totality of the Father's love and is ready to do everything in love. It is the inner penetration of love that elicits the, self, the identity of love equally powerful in all three persons, which is both the fruit as well as the conclusive manifestation of the absoluteness of divine love, once more with all this taking place within the divine identity. We're going to go on to his analogy of personal surrender. To be sure, Balthazar acknowledges that Augustine's aband uh, abandoned his own analogy of the Trinity as love for the sake of preserving divine unity, a concern that is perhaps not always adequately addressed in Balthazar's own theology, as numerous crit critics have pointed out. As for Aquinas, the the option of attributing the Son's procession to the Father's love is banned in his vigilant effort to defend Orthodox teaching. If the Father generates the Son out of love, this would mean that the latter is generated as an act of will, rather than by nature. But this is equivalent to the Arian heresy. Balthazar, on the other hand, ironically refutes for the same reason, that of avoiding heresy, to attribute the procession of the Son to knowledge. Barred at the outset, Balthazar says, is the idea that the Father generates the Son so as to know himself as God, and likewise the idea that he generates the Son because he already knows himself perfectly. The first position would be Hegelian, Balthazar explains. The second, thought through consistently, would be Arianism. Instead, Balthazar suggests that the immemorial priority of self-surrender or self-expropriation, thanks to which the Father is Father, cannot be ascribed to knowledge but only to groundless love, which proves the identity of love as the transcendental par excellence. Of course, two different questions about the divine processions are being posed by these authors. 
the how of Aquinas and the why of Balthazar. The latter nonetheless recognizes that the two questions are not unrelated, given the identity of will and nature in God. Indeed, his own Trinitarian theology seeks to reunite the two in the aftermath of nominalism's destructive influence upon Western thought. God's freedom coincides with the act quality of his nature, Balthazar insists. Following the lead of Adrian von Speyer, he proposes a recapitulation of the nature-based processions in a divine freedom that goes to their very origin. So this is getting back to what Father Thomas Joseph said today. I think he's right on the bullet with that point. Such, he explains, ultimately excludes every ontic priority of mere necessity over divine freedom, but also every arbitrary exercise of will. For God is beyond the terms necessity and freedom. On the basis of this insight, Balthazar seeks to defend the proposition that God's absolute freedom of self-possession is, according to the absolute nature, limitless self-giving. The Swiss theologian re reasons, for example, that the father, far from losing himself in the, father's, in the son's generation, is always himself by giving himself. And so, too, the son is always himself by allowing himself to be generated. As for the spirit, he is both the highest divine sovereign freedom and perfect selflessness, one who exists only for father and son. From this perspective, ecstasis and enstasis are one, going out and staying within, simply two sides of the same thing. The divine persons are themselves only insofar as they go out to the others. The going out to the others is in turn illustrated, again in terms borrowed from Adrian von Speyer, realms of freedom within the Godhead, which come about both through the self-giving of the hypostasis and by each hypostasis in turn letting the other to be. Of course, Balthazar explains we can only speak of this in metaphor. After all, the possessions in God are not free in any arbitrary sense, nor can God be thought of as subject to eternal necessity. Instead, the procession should be understood as arising from a natural or necessary will in God, which proceeding from the Father to the Son, and from the Father and the Son to the Spirit, grounds an irreversible order. These so-called areas of infinite freedom should not therefore obscure the fact that each hypostasis in God possesses the same freedom and omnipotence and each is co-determined by the Ordo Processionis and the Trinitarian unity. With similar caution, Balthazar admits that there's only one freedom of the divine essence. After all, a personal will destroys the very notion of the divine nature. Nonetheless, this one freedom is possessed by each hypostasis in his own specific way as is implied by their circumcision, which he presents as their total being for one another. In short, the hypostases determine in their circumcisio what God is and wills and does. To further illustrate the dynamic unity of the divine persons, Balthazar employs the German word hingabe, again, just to drive the point home, as borrowed from Adrian von Speyer, and although it is generally translated in English as surrender, it evokes this idea of giftedness or generosity from Gaba, and that of orientation or tendency as, as conveyed by the prefix hin, which is not far, Balthazar observes, from what St. Thomas presents as the center ratio of the divine relations, that is to say, they're being toward. That's how we distinguish the persons, their relations. Hence, the same word can be used to express the Father's begetting of the Son and the Son's 
reception of the entire divine essence, including the one divine will, from the Father. What is expressed in each case is thus different so as to be complementary in what might be considered a dynamic perspective of unity, a unity that is neither static nor actualized. There is, after all, no potency in God, um, and I really don't, we've had a lot of debates on this, but I really don't read potency into Balthazar's God. I do read a lot of potency into the commentators of Balthazar's God. Um, what is expressed in each case is thus different so as to be complementary. Okay, uh, where am I? Balthazar's conception of God is sometimes claimed to but a unity in act. Borrowing from Adrian von Speyer, Balthazar explains that the active axio of the Son with respect to the Father and of the Spirit with respect to the Father and the Son is a condition of the active axio and imparts to the latter a certain quality of letting go. Indeed, even the Father's active axio is qualified by the passive axio of the Son and the Spirit, which in no way denies, but rather accents the fact that the power of self-surrender, characterizing the Son's generation by the Father, is itself received by the Son from the Father and by the Spirit from the Father and the Son. Or to express this mystery in still more metaphorical language proper to von Speyer, Every hypostasis in his own decline causes the other to rise in what might be considered an eternal kenosis of the divine persons to one another. As the citation serves to illustrate, even the kenosis of Philippians 2.7 is recognized by Balthazar as a form in time and thus a revelation of the Son's eternal responsive surrender to the Father's own primary kenosis also understood in terms of surrender, the metaphorical expression of his generating the Son by lovingly handing over the entire divine substance, yet without losing his Godhead in the act of self-surrender. The Father must not be thought to exist prior to the self-surrender in an Arian sense. He is, Balthazar explains, this movement of self-giving that holds nothing back. And this in turn means that the Son receives from the Spirit not merely something, but the self-giving Father himself, and who receives the giving in the gift. In receiving, therefore, the Son is not only thanksgiving, Eucharistia, he's also gift in return, offering himself for all that the Father's self-giving may require, his willingness is absolute. This, then, is the manner in which we are to stand, understand Balthazar's bold claim that precisely in, and only in, the kenosis of Christ, the inner mystery of God's love comes to light, the mystery of the God who is love, in himself, and therefore is triune. For if the self-giving of the Father to the Son, and of both to the Spirit, corresponds to God's intimate essence, then this can itself only be love. The sign of the God who empties himself into humanity, death, and abandonment by God shows us why God came forth from himself, indeed descended below himself, as creator of the world. It corresponds to his absolute being in essence to reveal himself in his unfathomable and absolutely uncompelled freedom as inexhaustible love. This love is not the absolute good beyond being, but it is the depth and height, length and breadth of being itself. Now to wrap up, I have to admit that such a presentation of the canonical love at the heart of the imminent trinity cannot simply be taken for granted. Notwithstanding the positive value of Balthazar's attempt to enter more directly into the mystery of the personal Trinitarian relations qua personal, Gilbert, Gilbert Narcisse, 
challenges the idea of an inner Trinitarian kenosis as more suggestive than demonstrative, sometimes more doubtful than true. Similarly, our dear Emmanuel Durrell, and see, I did read that article, Emmanuel, I'm even citing you here, acknowledges that Balthazar's presentation of the Trinitarian processions in terms of love is more consistent with scripture than is the Augustinian analogy adopted by St. Thomas, but he questions the biblical foundation of Balthazar's depiction of an eternal kenosis proper to each person and of an eternal drama that is the archetype of the cross. Balthazar is thus accused, and rightly so, of creating a Balthazarian analogon, which Durand identifies as the law of extreme love that gives itself in competition with the Augustinian analogon and exposed to the same risks. And to be sure, the Swiss theologian does acknowledge that the concept of kenosis has an entirely anthropomorphic side. Wench's attempt to preserve the divine immutability precisely by placing God's self-surrender, which expresses the very essence of God, in God himself. Disputable is nonetheless Balthazar's presentation of the economic kenosis as the revelation in terms of the world of the kenosis or selflessness of the love of Father and Son at the heart of the Trinity especially when this entails a so-called Trinitarian inversion, reversing throughout the earthly mission of Christ the order of the processions between Son and Spirit. Such a reversal is no minor detail, of course, since it's precisely the order of the hypostases which distinguishes them. Balthazar is thus accused of introducing a rupture between the economic and imminent trinity thereby calling into question the revelation of the latter by means of the former. From this perspective, the decision to root analogical discourse and reasoning from created image to divine archetype in what he calls pathology, from archetype to image, is unlikely to speak in his favor, especially when the divine archetype is the subject of the most contentious of Balthazar's metaphorical depictions. He speaks, for example, of distance, separation, risks, suffering, surprise, and even alienation as pointing to the distinction of hypostasis for the purpose, ironically enough, of serving the revelation of their unity and reciprocal love. You see, I've read you too, Bernard. Such depictions give the impression that his so-called catalogical reasoning is far more earthbound than he claims, since he thereby introduces into the Godhead concepts that can only bespeak created being, concepts pointing to imperfections, unfulfillment, potency, and thus comprising the divine nature. As a case in point, Rowan Williams points to the specificity of the cross and the dereliction of the crucified as anchoring everything in Balthazar's theology. I, meanwhile, have argued, most especially in my book, that the divine missions, I'm sorry, that his purpose is, is the contrary, to found the economic kenosis and thus the divine missions within the eternal processions. These, in turn, precisely in their circumcision, are portrayed as prototypical of all that we know as love, for it is love that Balthazar recognizes as the greatest of God's attributes. From the perspective of these obvious limitations, it's evident that Balthazar has some need of metaphysical precision and dogmatic clarity that the church's common doctor has to offer. Precisions that Balthazar himself willingly called upon, especially in his most recent volumes. The question remains whether Thomas might likewise have something to gain from Balthazar. I would suggest that Balthazar's exaggerated personalism might help to balance the overstated essentialism that characterizes much of scholasticism's in anomalous wake. 
including certain strains of Thomism. Now, this is not obviously not a comment against St. Thomas, but rather his disciples. Meant as an antidote, of course, this essentialist exaggeration has nonetheless led to a widespread misunderstanding of St. Thomas's teaching, whence the tendency to separate what Aquinas strictly joined, his treatise on the De Deo Uno and that of the De Dio Trino. With priority being awarded, as Father Gilles Marie insists, neither to the divine essence nor to the mutual relationship, but instead to the divine person who unites these two dimensions. Similarly, it's likely in reaction to the long reign and enduring influence of nominalism that Catholic theology has focused so largely upon the analogy of being in the description of the creator-creature relation that has often failed to acknowledge, as Balthazar points out, that the creature's metaphysical and theological locus is the diastasis of the divine persons and the unity of the divine nature. His point, as I previously explained it, this is a citation from my own book, is that our description of God and of the creature's relation to him should be located beyond the opposition between physique, antique, and purely personal concepts. His is a freedom that so pervades his old own being that there cannot be a remainder of being outside this freedom nor could there be some corner of his being managed to withdraw from this freedom. If then we wish to have an adequate analogy of the one God and three persons, we must have access to both essentialist and personalist concepts. And this in turn implies that we must have access not only to the notion of likeness, but also to that of difference. And the divine mystery should be analogically addressed, therefore, not only in terms of the creature's unity of being and in virtue of which it might be likened unto him who identifies with being, essay est, terms focusing upon the divine simplicity, but also in terms of creature, creaturely differences, terms emphasizing the plurality of the divine persons, uniting the two, essence and person, plurality, is the fruitful tension in Balthazar suggests the key notion of surrender. Indeed, quite like St. Thomas, the Swiss theologian insists that the divine essence is no fourth element, something common to the three persons. It is rather their eternal life itself in the processions. To think otherwise is, to repeat Balthazar's insistent claim, to challenge arguably the most important Christian doctrine, Deus Caritas Est. Of course, this claim, in that is to say the precise manner in which Balthazar understood it, also merits patient consideration and respectful response from Thomas, especially in light of personalism's pervasive influence in popular religious belief and recent magisterial teaching. Fidelity to the master's example of constant dialogue with contemporary culture in an honest pursuit of truth requires as much. Thank you.
neglect, his compassion, and uh, forgiveness take over. So I, I'm just reading between a tradition which comes from Peru the Nazis, which we find in Bonaventure, and some other sources they know about this. On one side where there is a kind of unfolding on love from being self, of a crazy being, and on the other side, the more dramatic, prophetic depiction of love. Uh, does Balthazar John to kind of references of this is just uh, art in the perception? You know, maybe Martin, you would have a comment on this, but I mean, instinctively, I find myself saying, Balthazar constantly, I mean, this was his so insistent, come back to the figure of Christ. This is where theology begins and ends. So it's in contemplating the figure of Christ. And yes, most particularly at the moment where love manifests itself most on the cross. Um, so he's constantly, you read throughout Balthazar over and over again, the figure of Christ, the Gestalt, the this is God showing himself. And he will interpret the rest of scripture from this framework. I mean, we this is God's full revelation of himself, which sheds light on all other revelation. So yes, instead of beginning with the one God that we would find in the Old Testament, for example, Balthazar instinctively is going to begin with the Christ figure. But maybe, Martin, you have a comment on that better than I would. Thank you. I think he combines these two. And uh, I think the, the problem of wrath and Justice, judgment. Um, actually, there's an interesting book in uh, English by Abraham Peter, Jesus the Bridegroom. And Peter shows that the cross, as it is uh, presented in the Gospels, is, the, is presented as a marriage between Christ and, and the Humanity, so to speak. And this is to combine mm. these two things. And I think this would uh, also be Balthazar's uh, view. That, uh, for him, the most important thing is, as you said, is the cross. You know, that's just the, the, the ultimate love. Lambert de Dieu est for you. As you say in New France, mm. at least. And this is uh, for you, is uh, expressed in the cross, and that's not uh, opposed to this bridal um, erotic view of love. It's its fulfillment, 
of this is dialoguing with, with these guys. Um, but yeah, Balthazar has been deeply indebted. I mean, for me, I'm amazed that so few Balthazarians read Adrian van der Beyer because he said himself, we are inseparable. You cannot know my theology if you're not reading Adrian. And I have read them simultaneously always. And he draws directly. Uh, so many of these figure, these images, and some of the true brilliance of Balthazar is just verbatim Adrienne. Um, and she he depicts very visually, uh, in, in very creative, creative terms, this, this God, who, who, the Christian God. Um, so I think that he takes over a lot of that language, maybe too directly. Um, and I, I think, he, I really do believe he means this to be read metaphorically. Um, the, the question is, how, where do we draw the line? Uh, yeah. Although scripture itself, right, is, is very metaphorical in, our, in, in much, of, especially the prophetic literature, in the way God is presented. So, yeah, something to think about. I'm, I'm still, I'm still um, walking along that path myself. We're going to take one more question before break. Actually, it's a very long and question. Why is the faith not? Oh, because because it hasn't been published yet. <laughs> uh, and and yeah, it'll come soon. I hope. <laughs>